Hello and welcome to Japan Foundation Touring Film Program 2021 online special. My name is Junko Takekawa, Senior Arts Program Officer of Japan Foundation London, and I'm responsible for the programming of the contents. This evening marks the first day of the three weeks of the program, and I'm delighted and thrilled to be able to start our annual event in slightly a different format this time. We normally work closely with UK cinemas nationwide, but online means that we are forced to cut the tie with our loyal and long-standing partners, which was a very difficult decision for us. However, we were also determined not to be defeated by ever mutating, mutating COVID-19, and would like to run ahead of it. So making it online was a solution we came up with, and then I hope this format will give a big opportunity for not only for those people who are frequent viewers of our annual film program, but also for those who have never come to join us for some reason to enjoy a taste of Japanese cinema and then Japan itself without moving their bums. I said this is annual program. Since 2004, we, the Japan Foundation, whose aim is to promote Japanese culture and encourage culture exchange between Japan and overseas, have been offering a fine selection of Japanese film to the UK audiences. And it is now regarded as the biggest film season of Japanese films on tour in the UK. Being behind it since its outset and pushing it to grow, I cannot thank enough those who have been involved in this program and then have continuously supported to reach a high level. There are, of course, audiences, UK cinema, cinemas and their staff, as well as many specialists in and out of the UK. Also, my thanks go to my colleague, Diane Dea Cruz, who, despite my de demanding call, has managed to keep her chin up since she joined us a few years earlier and then Taguchi Eiji, a big boss who supported us for this ambitious project. In 2019, it is reported that approximately 619 Japanese cinemas were released in Japan. Therefore, the 18 works I have chosen for this program under the theme of a sense of belongings and the existing is like a, a drop in a big ocean. But it is my wish that it is an effective job to make audience understand a good example of current film making practice in Japan and to give food for thought on issues in Japanese society. I also believe films should be fun and entertaining. I normally love serious and depressing films, but this time I have made a conscious effort to choose more fun films in order to lift up spirits. I hope my strategy will work. So, in order to give a flavor of the program, I'd like to show a trailer and some images from the lineup. The first film I'm trying to introduce is that a hit by Imaizumi Rikia. Recently, I have identified more and more films which directly explore LGBTQ issues that have been released. Of course, there were previous other works where these issues were touched upon by filmmakers and then probably Crossnet is a recognized exa good example in the UK. But most of them, th them were marginal. Coming into the second decade of 21st century, these films with LGBTQ themes are breaking into the commercial mainstream and are played by stars and watched by mass audiences. His is a very well made rendering not just in love relationship between two men, but also the fear of marginalization in society, as well as how such relationship affect conventional family life. I'm hopeful that more LGBTQ films will be produced for the many years to come, so I will be able to introduce one form of diversity that Japanese films are progressing into. By the way, Alex Davidson, today's panel, wrote a spa program note for this work, which is added a bonus in watching this film. So here is a trailer. Shun? Hmm? Wakare yokka? Heh. 
井川は大学の時に男と同棲してたって違いますよ<笑>自分を隠して生きてきた僕の前にいやずっと忘れられなかった恋人が突然子供を連れて現れた俺はやっと渚のことを忘れて生きていこうとしてたのにだったらなんであの時一緒にいてくれなかったんだよやっと分かったんだ俺が求めてたのは旬だってはいダメママみたいにやって私井川さんのことが好きですパパとママとしゅんくんもみんなで一緒に暮らそうよ大成功連れて帰るから待てって話して。俺、お前とソラちゃんと三人で生きていきたい。神様とお願いだから。花井先生ちゃんを引き取りたいのですか。違います。ソラちゃんがあなたたちゲイのカップルの元で育てられるとこの先どんな苦労が待ち受けているか。差別的先入観に基づいた議論を求めているにすぎません。誰が誰を好きになろうとその人の勝手やで。好きに生きたらいいもう自分に嘘をつかないと決めたこれが僕たちの物語ヒス OK next film I would like to introduce is A Girl Missing by director 深田浩二 A few of the films in the lineup deal with similar circumstances identified in Japanese contemporary society in one way or another. A perpetrator's family falling victim to being viciously attacked and accused by anonymous voices through internet or media, both believing that they are pursuing justice. Before the internet, those perpetrators and the related family may have been outcast by villagers they used to, be, used to belong with. But now, in a digital age, you may easily lose your place in society overall, even for a crime you didn't commit. Fukada's film, with his original story, superbly captures the chilling circumstances. There is also a film like Soare, where ignore the child abuse has scarred a young life and the struggle of young people at the bottom of Japanese society. The film shines a light on the darkness in Japan that you may not want to see, but it is a reality not to be missed. As I said earlier, there are many fun films, and if you seek to laugh, films such as Farewell Comedy of Life Begins with a Lie or Not Quite Dead Yet are there to choose from. As for the Not Quite Dead Yet, the director, Hamasaki, kindly sent a special video message. Which you can view it on our cinema website. Enjoy films may be your prime concern, but we believe that having an opportunity to meet the creator, creators, and specialists up close and personnel is equally important. In pre COVID 19, we invited directors from Japan and took them to various venues in the UK. However, this time it has to be done online. The upside is that we could manage to invite a larger than ever number of creators and specialists to come and give their views. And then, whether or not you are going to watch the related films, we try to make the talk fun and insightful, and you can join us wherever you are. The first of the talk series is tonight's event, the place of Japanese Cinema UK. I'm delighted to welcome four panelists from the UK for this round table discussion to explore how Japanese films and their perception by audiences, professional alike, have evolved in the past years and how activities such as program, our program helped to introduce Japanese cinema. While some of the remarks from the panels and audience may ting tingle my ears, but they are certainly useful to improve the program for the future. The panels are Alex Davidson, cinema curator at Barbican, Jennifer Coates, senior lecturer in Japanese studies at the University of Sheffield, Peter Mumford, Saturday screening program at QAD, Q, Quad Derby. Quad Derby is a, a friend cinema for the Turing film program. 
Ren Scateni, freelance critic and curator based in Edinburgh, and then I will join it as well. Jennifer and Ren have also written insightful, insightful program note for Mrs. Noisy and the Shape of Red, respectively. Before I hand the button over to Alex, who will act moderator for this roundtable discussion, I'd like to go through some housekeeping matters. Today's event will be recorded. As we are using webinar function, your name will not be viewable by other attendees. However, I strongly recommend you to keep your audio and video muted throughout, just in case. If you have any question for the panelists, please use the Q&A function to send in your question at any time. Remember that the attendees' question may be seen by everyone else so that you can improve, you can avoid a particular question placed by another person which you would like answered or if it is the same as yours. Simply click the thumb up icon next to the question you wish to avoid. Unfortunately, due to time restrictions, we may not be able to pick up all, the, all of the questions you asked. So my apologies in advance. Lastly, as always, we will send you an online questionnaire. So please spare a short moment to complete it for a future event. Thank you so much for listening to my um, introduction. Let's start program and the event begin. Hand it over to Alex. Thanks very much, Junko. Uh, hello, uh, my name is Alex Davidson and I'm a curator at the Barbican, which is a cross art centre based in London. And uh, I work in the cinema team working uh, with archive films and new cinema releases and uh, new films, uh, programming thematically around a theme, working with film festivals and partners uh, for our cinema screens and for our new VOD platform, Barbican Cinema On Demand. And I'm gonna kick off by asking each of our panelists to uh, introduce themselves and say a few words about their work and their connections to Japanese uh, cinema. So I'll, I'll start with myself. So we do program quite a lot of Japanese cinema at the Barbican. In fact, the most successful, commercially successful season we've ever had was uh, called Anime's Human Machines, which we programmed in 2019, which uh, explored the relationship between um, humanity and technology through Japanese animation. And this included well-known titles like Ghost in the Shell to some much harder films to see on the big screen in the UK. And we also program regularly with partners such as the Japanese Avant-Garde and Experimental Film Festival and of course the Japan Foundation, who we worked with on a special screening of uh, Tanaka Kinuyo's 1953 melodrama Love Letter, which is an absolutely beautiful film. So um, if each panelist could say a few words about who they are, where they're based and uh, what their particular interests or specialisms are in regard to Japanese cinema, I'll work through uh, alphabetically by surname. So I'll start with Jennifer. Thanks, Alex. Uh, I'm Jennifer Coates. I'm a senior lecturer in Japanese studies at the School of East Asian Studies up here in the University of Sheffield. Um, so I'm really excited to be able to see all of these films online without traveling uh, from my home. I'm a specialist in Japanese cinema and I've written quite a bit about gender and representation in uh, 1950s and 1960s Japanese cinema. So I'm really excited by the theme that Junko has chosen for this season. I think uh, the question of finding your place is something that a lot of people are thinking about right now. Thanks, Jennifer. Uh, uh, Peter, if you'd like to say a few words. Yes, good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Peter Munford. I am a member of staff at Quad in Derby, which is an art centre with a three screen cinema setup. Um, since 2012 at Quad, I've been programming films under the banner of Satori Screen, which is based around East Asian cinema broadly, but a lot of the stuff I've shown has been Japanese films. And um, since I think 2015, we've been hosting the Japan Foundation Touring Film Programme and it's kind of become a core part of our cinema programme. Every year, uh, usually in February, we have a weekend of films for the programme and it kind of is the highlight of the year for Satori Screen. So I'm very grateful for Junko to inviting me along this evening. Thanks, Peter. Uh, Ren, you're next. Sure, thank you, Alex, and hi, everyone. I'm Ren Skateni. I'm a freelance writer, curator, and programmer. And in my writing, I mostly focus um, about uh, Japanese cinema and East Asian cinema. And last year, I've curated a program of short films um, by uh, Japanese filmmaker uh, Yoshigai Nao at the Barbican. 
and then um, been also like on the uh, programming team at the uh, Glasgow Soft Film Festival. Usually I'm like interested in uh, showcasing and highlighting the work of like emerging uh, female filmmakers, especially from Japan, of course. So uh, I'm really happy to see that there are a few of them in the program and I'm also interested in like in queer films. So uh, it's, it's amazing that these films are kind of thriving right now, or at least they're starting to just mushroom in the, uh, in the Japanese uh, cinema industry. Thank you. And uh, I think a lot of you all know who Junko is, but uh, Junko, if you could say a few words, just well, for people I, who I may be find it. As is, actually, um, um, unlike other people, I didn't actually start as a film expert, um, although I like films, but um, my job or my job description is to sort of, you know, taking care of that um, all arts project, you know, project or programs, it's plural. So I have to actually oversee that uh, exhibitions, CSRs and films, and also, to, you know, dealing with that. Uh, supporting programs like you know grants sort of you know application or whatever so it's just really diverse uh, my work is but in so doing of course I get to know what is missing of course and uh, what should be actually what we could do to you know promote Japanese culture and cinema itself so that's how we actually started how I started this program that's all thank you very much Right, so um, I'll start with my first question, which I'm going to throw open to everyone, um, which is, it's quite a, it's quite a big one, but it's about, uh, you, you are all based in different areas of the UK, you all have different specialisms and interests, you all have curated for different audiences, be it for students, be it for uh, one-off events, be it for uh, re regular cinema strands. And I wondered if you'd noticed in your time, and this is both as a curator, but also as, a, as an audience member and a, 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 a lover of Japanese cinema, whether you'd noticed any particular changes over the last decade or two about the kind of uh, Japanese films that get uh, a warm reception by UK audiences. And just to speak personally, I remember in the sort of late 1990s, early 2000s, that uh, Japanese horror films would be shown um, very regularly and be programmed in art house venues and chains like Picture House or Everyman or those equivalents. Whereas now, though those films still are finding audiences, they're often um, shown at film festivals, uh, be it horror or Japanese film festivals, or they're shown online, but that regular, art house exhibition seems to have changed. And I wondered if you had any thoughts on uh, how audiences, what, 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 what kind of um, Japanese films at the, uh, over the last few years have received perhaps more popularity. So um, I'll, start, I'll start with Peter, if you have any views. You're, you're oh, sorry, yes, immediately forgot. Um, yeah, um, okay, so um, yeah, I, I very remember very well the late 90s early 2000s kind of the age of extreme boom that was kind of when i was first making regular trips to the cinema and i saw a lot of those films at the sheffield showroom and um, and it's kind of i guess that lasted i don't know five six years and then sort of went away and the, those films were still being made but they were just turning up on dvd and things and we're at the point now I streaming's probably got a lot to do with where if you're a Japanese filmmaker who isn't Hirokazu Koreeda, your film's probably not going to get a wide release in this country. And even if it, if a distributor does pick it up, they're not going to have a marketing budget to uh, actually let people know about it, which is disappointing in many ways. So yeah, it's that's why Japan Foundation Toy and Film Program has become so valuable, I think, because so many films that are worthy of being seen in this country are just not being picked up for one reason or another, whether that's distributors feel they aren't going to recoup their costs on them or Japanese companies aren't making them available but yeah so I, I'm always on the lookout for new films to show and half the time I'm looking at the schedules and a film will a Japanese film will appear on the schedule kind of two weeks before it's in cinemas and it'll go into one screen in six multiplexes in major cities with no advertising, I do a monthly event, so quite often, and I quite often have to book kind of six weeks, two months in advance, and it's just not possible for me to even fit that film in. So it, it becomes difficult, yes. So hopefully, I'm not sure I've answered your question, but uh, yeah. Well, no, I mean, I, I think it's a, I think that's a really shared experience. I mean, I was going to ask uh, Jennifer the same question. Um, I, don't, I don't know if you're based in Sheffield or, but, but it's the, the showroom is such a wonderful cinema, but I don't know whether. You have uh, whether the the cinemas around she in Sheffield and around uh, do show much in the way of Japanese cinema. Have you whether you've seen any kind of changes in the kind of exhibition of Japanese cinema in the UK? 
I mean, I'll be very honest with you, Alex. I am based in Sheffield, but I've only been here for about a year and a half. And because of the pandemic, obviously the cinemas have been closed. Um, I was in Norwich for a year before that, but before that I was actually work, living and working in Japan. So I was living and working in Kyoto for four years. And I think one of the things that I find very interesting as a comparison between the kind of cinema cultures in Japan versus what we see here is on the one hand, I think a little bit of an obsession here with new releases. Whereas I think the retrospective film program is still such a core part of everyday cinema culture in many cities in Japan. So I think in some ways we're missing out a little bit when we don't think about retrospective programming as well as new cinema coming out of Japan. I think as Peter pointed out, and I think you might have said this yourself as well, Alex, you know, the streaming platforms are really bringing a lot of new cinema and new anime to us very immediately. And I do wonder in the future, you know, going into the next few years, will it really be the role of the cinema theaters to try to compete with that sort of, you know, bringing the new content to people who want to see it? Or will the theater become something maybe a little bit more theatrical once again, uh, where you think about what kind of films do people really want to watch on the big screen rather than just what is kind of the newest thing coming from Japan at the moment. Can I, can I say something? Sorry. Mm. Yeah. Um, just echoing what Sir Peter says and then Jennifer says, um, I've been actually sort of been watching that what kind of films is very popular, for example, has been popular. I and mean, certainly as Peter pointed out that horror and then also violent films uh, not particularly, you know, that top sort of, you know, priority or top preference among uh, audiences. Um, some actually sort of, you know, audience commented very rightly that those sort of films like violent and uh, quirky and then uh, horror films are easily available in the DVD, but other films are not available. So certainly there is a kind of hunger for, you know, um, the film, Japanese films, um, other than that, those extreme films, uh, Japanese extreme film itself. And uh, um, so it's uh, very interesting that's uh, what Peter says. And then also that's, um, you know, talking to the Jennifer's, you know, uh, echoing Jennifer's sort of, you know, question, it's very interesting how that online cinema or theatrical screening uh, will actually share the places or whatever, if I may say. I personally, personally believe in theatrical screening, to be honest with you. Although we have to do it online, but I know many directors, you know, regardless of where they are, made a film for theatrical screening, big you know, uh, images. And sometimes I was told by many directors that their camera work, for example, was set to so, you know, screen for the bigger screen rather than just tiny you know, like eye players or sort of, you know, um, you know, computer. So I think it's actually fair and the right to put that theatrical screening, any sort of Japanese films, that is actually, you know, um, meeting that the director's, you know, initial intention. Of course, nonetheless, there is a films made specific for online. So, um, so that uh, we need probably, um, you know, um, share that uh, kind of territory um, in the between the online and the theatrical screen. And also, I want to point out that uh, issue, issues of experience, so to speak, cinema experience, which is, you cannot, it, it is something you cannot miss. Because when I watch the screen or whatever in, you know, um, selecting, in the process of selecting films, sometimes I'm just scratching my head. Is it really funny? Or is it really good? And I'm not really sure, but sometimes throw that film in order to make a balance. But when I go to the cinema and actual attending actual screening, people just laugh. It's like a synergy effect. I mean, one person laughed, but another people started laughing. So I think you can't miss that experience to be shared in theatrical screen. Sorry, I just talked too much. So just Alex. No, not at all. I think that would be a view that, that most people, would, would, um, including on the panel, but also watching, would be very sympathetic to. And I wanted to uh, bring Ren into the conversation, um, not because I know Ren programmed a, 
amazing event for the Barbican, which was shown both on the cinema. Uh, we were very blessed actually, we were able to show it in, um, I think it was October, which was just between lockdowns, but it also went online. Um, and Ren, would you mind just talking a little bit about what that project was and uh, what your experience was um, with curating it? Yeah, absolutely. So um, basically, the uh, the program was, uh, as I said before, it was about like the short films of this uh, kind of emerging film filmmaker from Japan. She's called uh, Yoshigai now, and um, a few of her shorts previously were screened in Montreal at Fantasia Film Festival. And then, yeah, basically, came across them through like um, a friend of mine who introduced the films to me, and then I got really interested in them and really wanted to show them like in the UK as well. Well, because sometimes I feel like um, short uh, filmmakers who mainly work with like short films are not uh, as much highlighted as other like uh, feature uh, films filmmakers. So sometimes you really need to, to spotlight them um, outside of the um, of the uh, let's say short film festivals. So uh, this program in particular was about. Um, Basically, like Yoshigai shorts are focusing on um, powerful women, but uh, who has like this kind of um, intriguing uh, connections with nature. And uh, these films focus also like on the uh, connections between like uh, uh, women in terms of like friendship. And sometimes these relationships are kind of uh, blurry the boundaries between friendship and maybe something more. But they're kind of experimental because they also incorporate some um, like dancing scenes and this kind of stuff because Yoshigai is also like a choreographer and a dancer herself. So uh, yeah, um, that was mainly the uh, the thing I really wanted to do with the um, with the program and also just to say a few things about uh, the changes of the uh, of Japanese cinema in the UK as well. I mean, I've came to the UK like five years ago now, pretty much. And before that, I mean, I was like uh, in Italy because I come from Italy. So uh, I've, uh, since I've been living like in Scotland and from what I could see here, I should say that we got this really great uh, festival uh, focusing like on animation, which is called like uh, Scotland Loves Anime. So uh, every year they basically like program this um, great uh, programs about anime but then they're not only focusing on you know the biggest mainstream like films of like Makoto Shinkai or maybe uh, Yuhata and some other um, filmmakers but there are also like less mainstream titles in there and they're also kind of fostering this idea of um, um, of having like uh, conversations and um, yeah, just to foster the uh, the community of like people loving anime as well. But also, I would say a few. Uh, I would also like to highlight the work of like uh, independent exhibitors here in Scotland because sometimes they really bring about interesting and amazing programs. And like uh, in 2019 and then 2020, uh, for example, Matchbox Cine Club they did in Glasgow an incredible uh, little program that was like a really a gem. And they were uh, basically showing uh, experimental films from the, uh, the 70s and the 80s. And then after that, they uh, programmed a really short uh, program of the uh, early film of um, Obayashi Nobuhiko. And this program uh, screen at the uh, last edition of the Glasgow Shopping Festival. So there, there, there's an interest in Scotland as well um, in, in Japanese films, which some, I should say it's kind of less mainstream and less focused on like new releases. And it's more like kind of a niche uh, kind of sector in a way. And that's, yeah. that's really brilliant to hear because I think, um, this, I mean, obviously, a lot of this program in cities, whether where it is easy to put these, where, well, where there, are, where perhaps it's sometimes easy to find audiences for these films. Um, I wanted yeah. to ask some of the panelists about because you touched on it there, Ren. Is, is these films that don't necessarily get a, a cinema release but are shown for bespoke venues? Is the issue of rights and what it's like clearing rights for uh, these films? Because if you're showing a creative film, then uh, there's always a set deal that distributor has, which you either accept or don't, and then then you um, split the box office. And that's not how it would work for most um, Japanese films that don't fall into that new release schedule. And I wonder, P Peter, could you talk a little bit about your experience of programming uh, films like that, which aren't necessarily part of a new release uh, pattern? Yes, uh, 
it can be difficult. There's no two ways about it, really. Um, if a film has a UK distributor, cinema distributor, I should say, then it is fairly straightforward normally. Quite often, uh, distributors will buy a fil- the rights to a film for a 10-year period. So I know if I go on the BBFC website and put a title in, and if it's been classified in the last 10 years, then they probably still have the rights, and I can fire off an email, and hopefully someone will say, yes, here are the terms. So it's quite straightforward. It's then it's things like when you discover that distributors have only bought the DVD rights. And if you want to show that film in the cinema, then you have to then go and find the company in Japan and negotiate with them. They don't really understand the theatrical situation in the UK where a independent cinema in Derby is not going to be able to pay over a thousand pounds for a single screening of a film and break even. And that cuts off a lot of films to me to be honest. So quite often people say to me, why don't you show this film? And my answer is normally I'd love to, but it's just not possible at the moment. It requires a company to pick up the film in the UK. So it does become frustrating. And I have tried to negotiate with Japanese companies in the past. And uh, with one exception, it's always ended in failure just because financially it's just not viable. I mean, it's it's, it's so difficult um, because it's not just the the kind of the, I won't, I'm not going to name any names of distributors, but it, it can be under all archives. But it can it's not just the the very high license fee. I mean, I was quoted two thousand US dollars for something, and there was no budge. Um, but it's also if you want to show a film from thirty five mil, then you have to pay for the print uh, hire, which can be very expensive. And a lot of archives, quite rightly, are very very um, guarded about which cinemas they'll allow to show prints because they're very obviously very very um, fragile. Yes. Um, so yeah, I have to actually apologize on behalf of Japanese film industry. No. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, it is really true. It's very expensive, but I don't want to, you know, let people uh, you know, think that Japan Foundation has huge budget to, you know, run this program. We don't, we just don't. Um, so I negotiate very, very hard mm. um, with uh, distributors. I think that, um, um, uh, the advantage we have is that, unlike Pizza's Place, it's just one off. One off, you know, um, distributors tend to actually sort of cost, you know, charge too much because they have to think about that labor, you know, uh, labor cost or, you know, shipping or all sort of thing. But our touring pro- program has a guarantee certain number of the dis- exposure. And that, that's easier for me to negotiate than just only one off. Probably if it is one off, I face the same situation. But it took me for many years to reach this you know, um, level. And then again, I have to say, Japan Foundation doesn't have much money. So, so that's, um, you know, you know it's, it's the same way to, you know, um, to struggle. There's a certain film I can't blame because of the cost. So I, I don't really sort of, you know, deny that. You know, I, mean, I, I absolutely don't want this to be a pile on on <laughs> any kind of stuff because I, it's not unique to Japan either. I mean, there is a, it's a situation with a lot of international um, rights holders, and I think uh, yeah, we know. I mean, there are some amazing. There's some, and I think where I was kind of going with this is whether the partnership model might be something that cinemas um, embrace in the future, whether they can kind of cross programming across the UK because then that does open more room for, for negotiation. Um, I just want to say very briefly, because I can see in the chat a lot of people mentioning the, the BFI Player uh, Japan resource, which is absolutely fantastic. Um, an amazing blockbuster season was planned for last year uh, to mark the, um, at the Olympics, which sadly had to go online. A lot of it but could, but it's still a really fantastic resource, so I, I completely agree with all the comments saying check that out. Um, my, my next question um, is specifically aimed at Jennifer, um, because I wanted to ask if, um, as a lecturer, um, what areas of Japanese cinema do you think people um, gravitate uh, towards for their study and research? Because over the years, have you noticed if there have been any kind of changes in the kind of areas of Japanese cinema uh, that people might um, gravitate towards or focus on? Well, I teach both uh, Japanese cinema and Japanese culture more broadly. And I think one of the things that's quite interesting is what people who already feel like they're Japanese cinema fans want to watch. And then the kind of cinema that people come to because they have a broad interest in Japanese culture, but they haven't really narrowed in on film yet. Um, So with the students, for example, who take my contemporary Japanese society class, I often find that they end up writing their papers and even their dissertations on film 
but very much sort of using film as a lens into um, seeing areas of Japanese life and maybe also social problems that it would be harder to understand through personal observation. So things like um, social isolation, for example, aging, uh, anything related to disability, also LGBTQIA issues. Um, those seem to be things that students who have an interest in learning about Japanese life are really focused on. Uh, students who already know that they love Japanese cinema tend to come from a passion for anime. Uh, but I do try to challenge them a little bit in some of my courses and I had great success last year with, um, I don't know if anybody's familiar with the film Funeral Parade of Roses, which is quite a, yes. an out there Matsumoto Toshio kind of experimental documentary that even has some like vox pop interview anthropological style scenes inserted in there. Uh, so some of the students got really excited about that, which was great. But largely I would say anime and then social problem films seem to be the, the big focus. Really interesting. Um, I, I find, I mean, I, this is actually going to, this leads on to one of my next questions actually was, um, we know that some areas of Japanese cinema in the UK are easier to access than others. So we know that if it's not a classic hotel like Kurosawa, Otsu, Naruse, you know, those have had the full restoration, Blu-ray, DVD release online, um, lots of amazing uh, academic resources available fairly easily and reasonably priced. We know that uh, Studio Ghibli films tend to get a UK-wide release when they are available. Um, recently, I mean, this is speaking to my own kind of weird obsessions, but not weird, but, but, but just um, like my, my, I've just finished the Gamera box set uh, released by Arrow, um, which is 12 films with huge amounts of extra features like Kaiju Ego are, are much uh, more easy to access in the UK now than they ever have been before um, in Japanese and English subtitles until recently, but a lot of them dubbed and had to be ordered in from the US if you wanted the Japanese version. And I, I was wondering, Jennifer touched on this, what, what the kind of areas of Japanese cinema that each of you would like to see uh, more better represented uh, to UK audiences? Because for me, one of my great interests actually is LGBTQ plus cinema. And, um, you know, Funeral Parade of Roses got an amazing Blu-ray treatment by the BFI. Um, and, but some are much, much harder to see. There are these, uh, these pink films from the 80s, uh, I Like You, I Like You, and uh, 90s, um, Beautiful Mysteries, amazing film, well, very interesting, funny film, very important piece of satire, I Like You, I Like You Very Much is great as well, but not very easy to find. And uh, this is why I was so pleased to see his in the programme this year, um, and Close Knit, which is one of the best queer films I've seen in recent years, also got a lot of attention. So I'm, I'm just going to go around the, the round table asking if you think there are any areas of Japanese cinema that you'd love to see getting more of a spotlight here in the UK. Um, and I will start with Ren. Yeah, actually, I think I need to echo you, Alex, in saying that I would really love to see, like, um, uh, queer films like having more of a spotlight in the UK as well and in in particular I would say that I would also really love to see films about like lesbians and not only like uh, gay men and um, uh, although there are some films by Hashiguchi Ryosuke that I would really love to see like um, being highlighted more but these are like from the 90s uh, so uh, maybe they would really need like different kind of agreements in terms of rights and everything else and um, but yeah I mean there's a like there's a fantastic film by um, uh, uh, Kaze Shindo uh, which is really great called like Love Juice and this is from the, uh, the 2000s and that one would be a, a really nice uh, addition to like the uh, the, the, the area and the corpus of like uh, queer films from Japan. And also obviously I would really love to see more of like uh, Japanese, uh, female Japanese filmmakers who are not uh, Kawase Naomi or like other big names in, in the industry, but maybe like up and coming filmmakers or like emerging filmmakers and then yeah. I agree with everything you said. I think each of those I'd, I'd just love to see more of. And um, I'm, this is why such things like the Japan Foundation are just so brilliant to be able to get this kind of uh, broader uh, view. Um, Peter, same question. Are there any areas you'd like to see more yeah. of? Well, I'm, I'm quite a nerdy boy at heart, I guess. Um, so I'm fairly well served in terms of the kind of Japanese films that are released here in terms of horror films, uh, Kaiju Ega films have kind of had a resurgence in the last 12 months in this country, which has been fantastic to see. But just having seen so many films of the Japan Foundation Toy and Film Program, it's been the comedies that have stayed with me, these fairly mainstream Japanese comedies that um, 
really good films. They're really enjoyable, fun films. And the fact that they're in J Japanese has not stopped people enjoying them. And I do, because I do this monthly event and I have regular customers, I do have people who come up to me and say, how can I see Woodjob again? How can I see The Handsome Suit again? And I have to say to them, you probably can't, sorry. I mean, unless you want to go on some internet rabbit hole and try and find some DVD from Malaysia or Hong Kong or something, you're not going to find that film with English subtitles uh, easily available. And it's really sad because I guess there hasn't been, I can't think of a Japanese comedy film that's had a kind of a Western release since I guess the eighties with things like Tampopo and other Juzo with Tami films. And there's no reason why audiences wouldn't enjoy them. They could easily have kind of a, an art house release at the very least, but for some reason, I don't know whether it's the Japanese production companies are overvaluing them. So British distributors just don't think they're worth the expense or they don't have faith that an audience will come out to them. I'm not sure, but there's loads of, I can see Japanese comedies that would work fine in British cinemas. Mm. I think I, I agree. And I think this is, I think uh, this is my experience subjectively. I think a lot of distributors are very guarded about comedy films, not just from Japan, but, but from other um, countries um, where the sense of humor might not be one that they think what UK audiences could appreciate, which is a ridiculous um, overgeneralization. Um, by the way, I want to say thank you for all the comments. I can see a lot of uh, things being said in the sidebar, uh, including um, a lot of people backing the, the, the desire to have more documentaries uh, shown in the UK, which um, again, I agree with. Um, Jennifer, uh, do you think there are any areas of Japan, Japanese cinema that uh, you'd like to see brought over here in uh, more abundance? I mean, I agree with the people in the chat who are talking about documentaries and those um, maybe slightly challenging political quasi-documentary films. Like I think some people are mentioning uh, Harakazuo, Imamura Shohei, people like this, like Junko, I do enjoy a challenging film. Uh, so some of those kind of uh, possibly longer, slightly more experimental films that really push the boundaries of the theatrical experience. Um, but I think also comedy films, as people are saying, it would be nice to see some 60s, some 70s comedy, maybe some earlier Masumura Yasuzo um, or Okamoto Kihachi. Also, I think there would be an interesting parallel between some of the themes that we're seeing in this particular program, like Mrs. Noisy, for example, and uh, issues of sort of neighborliness and cohabitation would sit really nicely alongside something like Okamoto's uh, The Elegant Life of Mr. Everyman, for example. Thank you. And uh, Junko, do you have any um, areas you'd like to mention? I shouldn't say what I want to scream, but <laughs> if I actually say that, you know, echoing everybody's comments, for example, yes, I do agree that we should have more comedies. The problem is comedy is that I always have to think about, is it going to down, going down well? Because mm -hmm. there is a cultural um, uh, interpretation you may need added on to. Even I see it, I saw it, oh, it's funny. But because I know that culture behind it, not necessarily uh, those people who never actually experienced Japanese culture would appreciate it the same way as I did. So I'm a little bit cautious about this. So I don't, and also I don't want to push that Japanese film is wacky, for example, all the time. So um, I really need to take a you know, very good balance. And uh, yeah, documentary, I love to you know, show more documentary if it is appropriate and the classic films, we can't do, we couldn't do it this time because there are hardly any digital, digitalized you know, classic films other than BFI, BFI already had. So I try, I always try to avoid that, you know, already available films in the UK. So, but uh, as Jennifer says, we screened that um, Kiyaji Okamoto films before, and then that was really, really fantastic. And there was some cohesion to contemporary society. And then like a 10 dark woman, uh, women, I, we actually screened last year. That was a fantastic film. It was so stylish and good. And I've never been screened in this country so often. And there's a lot of classic films, you know, undiscovered. And uh, we'd like to bring in as much as we have a print and the print condition is, you know, worthwhile sort of putting onto the projector. Talking which, that, sorry, there's a many venues who abandoned, thrown away 35 projects in the projectors. That is another issue for us uh, to send in classic films. Even among those 22 
the venues. Handful of venues say can't do 35 millimeter anymore because there is no projectionist in this country, no projector, there's no space whatsoever. So we are uh, at a crossroad where what kind of, you know, um, uh, material can be screened in a even, you know, each venue itself. So we really have to think about way forward in terms of selection of films itself. Thank you. Um, I'm going to I'm going to start asking some of the uh, audience questions now. Thank you very much. There can be quite a lot here. I'll try and get through as many as I can. Um, and the first one actually is uh, leading leads on to a question I was going to ask about, which is from Peter Regelis. Apologies if I'm mispronouncing anyone's name. Um, which is, are there many Japanese films on Netflix or or other platforms? Because I think um, while there are especially curated platforms like BFI Player or Movie, which have um, brilliant uh, Japanese curation, film curation going on. Um, we are, I think that we are seeing more stuff on Netflix and on Amazon. And uh, the question I suppose would be, apart from the one about, you know, do you watch films on those platforms much yourselves? Do you feel this is a positive step towards enabling access when these sort of giants of VOD platforms are showing these films or whether you think there could be a, a detrimental side to it? Um, I will um, ask that question to Peter first. Uh, yes, there certainly are films on Amazon and Netflix in particular as the two kind of behemoths of streaming. But I think that they are, they're funding productions to try and attract subscribers in Japan. They're not interested in really bringing those films to a UK audience. So you can find them, but the algorithms are kind of burying that they, they assume you're not interested if you've, you've got a British IP address. So they're burying it and so you kind of have to train the Netflix and Amazon to show you them by watching them. So that's where I think a bit of curation with people pointing out that actually this film is available if you go and search for it because it's not going to come up on your new on Netflix because they Netflix assumes you're not interested. So um, they are there, then, but it's just it's, they're not always easy to find because they're not getting advertised. And unless someone tells you, you're not going to know they're there. Yeah. I, I, does anyone else agree with Peter on that format? I mean, do you watch that? Junko, yes, what do you like to say? Um, there's a few films I really wanted to include the Japan Funders to film program this year, but mm. couldn't because the um, uh, distributor said they're already bought by some UK online you know, uh, companies. They didn't tell me which one, but I suspect either Netflix or Amazon Primes. And then as a, as, a, as a policy, if they are commercially available, we regard it as commercially available, we are not going to include that um, so that we, I have to abandon it, almost like a shedding tears and I have to abandon it. But my actually not a shedding tears is not many people know it, you know, that those firms are on that, those online companies, you know, um, the platform. So as Peter says that I agree, and some sort of comment is that, you know, in the chat box there, it's very difficult to find, um, you know, what you want, unless you know the title itself. So that's a problem. I mean, I would slightly disagree, right, um, just based, based on the experience of uh, using Netflix in Japan, uh, when it first arrived in Japan, and then coming to the UK and accessing Japanese content, through the UK based Netflix. I think you're absolutely right. Definitely in uh, the early years of Netflix in Japan, there was an assumption that people based in particular countries only wanted to watch media in their native language and media you know, produced from the film industries that are domestic and, and close by. And I think definitely the first few years of Netflix in Japan was not at all successful because they were trying to sell Japanese content to Japanese customers and international content to international customers. Whereas when they pivoted and realized that actually Japanese language Netflix originals was going to be where sort of both uh, audience demographics would get interested, I think that became much more successful. And possibly I've just trained my algorithm as you say, feature, but I do find the platform suggesting particularly, you know, Japanese language Netflix originals to me. Um, but I think someone in the chat was also pointing out that it is actually quite easy just to search Japan and take a look at everything that there is there. I think the um, where it's still not competitive, I guess, is in anime. 
uh, where I think maybe Netflix is not actually trying to compete with Crunchyroll and some of the other uh, more diverse kind of platforms that offer a greater range of animated films. Actually, I have to agree with Jennifer here because maybe I'm totally biased, but since I only watch like things from East Asia, basically my Netflix, every time I log in, they basically recommend to me like everything from like East Asia. So every time it's like a new Netflix original from Japan or maybe from South Korea. And then uh, so, uh, to be fair, I think I haven't been shown something like from the UK at all, maybe, uh, but, but from Bridgerton, maybe. They're, could be like the, the only thing and then everything else is just like anime from Japan or like maybe some some TV series the one of the uh, the, the last few things that Netflix uh, suggested to me was like uh, the Japanese uh, TV series uh, Alice in, in Borderland and then I've got like some, so many others like titles being like thrown at me every time I log in and I don't really have time to watch them all and also I seems like people like um, uh, in the chat uh, speaking about uh, talking about movie and then yeah the thing with movie they sometimes have these amazing like films and sometimes they're like straight from film festivals and this is like obviously like a perk of the platform but um, it's not like they're focusing on like Japanese stuff so uh, it's basically uh, it's a gamble to be honest I mean you can subscribe but then uh, it could be that in there's no Japanese titles coming out in two months or something. I think right now they've got the uh, Odakaori's amazing documentary, uh, Senoti, the, the one that was like uh, screened first in Rotterdam last year and I watched that at the Rotterdam Film Festival and that's absolutely brilliant. And um, but yeah, apart from that, it's very like, yes, yeah, scattered around. And I think like Arrow, at the distributor as uh, a streaming platform or something. Maybe you can like buy some films to watch online. And I'm not sure if it's something they uh, came up uh, during the, uh, the pandemic, but there, there were some titles in there from like uh, Japanese like films that could be like interesting to have a look at. Thank you. Um, I, my next, my, I do, I'm, I'm just going on to the next question, but that was already, I'm, I'm on to actually investigate myself more some stuff on Netflix now, because it is something I, I, I'd like to see what kind of stuff they recommend to me um, on the algorithm. Um, a lot of this question is just for Junko, actually, because a lot of people are interested in the response to this, which is from Darcy Perkins, which is, if the goal is getting more people to watch more film, seeing as how the festival is online this year, why is there a limited number of tickets per film, even though they are virtual attendees, is it to do with licensing or technology? This is a question we get quite a lot with Cinema On Demand as well. So Junko, would you be happy to respond to that? Well, um, I'm not sure what people actually sort of, you know, um, uh, consider um, having that um, uh, film festival or, you know, putting a cinema online. Um, people may think that it's cheap and uh, it's easy, but it's not really, cheap and uh, easy and then uh, this time for many reasons we just offered a film uh, free of a charge but it costs us quite a lot to be honest with you and uh, uh, that's kind of probably misconception people you know may have unlike other theatrical you know gigantic sort of you know production or big exhibition well film is you just you know, press the button you can see it Probably you can see it on YouTube, you can see it, some sort of piracy films, which you, um, I can't recommend, but, but probably every sort of programmer, every sort of venue like Barbican and then Quad knows that it's not easy and it's not cheap. So um, expanding, offering more tickets, expanding that customers or, you know, whatsoever, is, it's just in the, in the balance act in terms of finance um, itself. And, uh, Talking about finance, for example, my intention is always try to reach out as many venues as possible. For example, Birmingham is now dropped. I really like to go to Birmingham, you know, next year or whatsoever. The problem is cinema venues itself has a financial problem and um, they just can't take a big risk. Um, that's one, one thing I normally sort of, you know, come across when I try to promote, okay, uh, can you can you you know uh, host a touring film program in let's say Southampton or Plymouth or Oxford or Birmingham? They say we only have a one you know, screen. We can't take you know take a risk. So that's a question um, I normally face. 
So it's great, like Quad. Quad is always, always, always encouraging and always supportive, but not everywhere is like that. So that's um, stopped me from expanding or expanding number of that audience who can experience our Turing Film Program. Thank you very much. Um, the next question, it's the comment and the question is from Lydia Brammer, who says, uh, just as Jennifer said, there seems to be a real lack of interest in older Japanese films. There are so many gems from the past that deserve a translation and English language distribution. You've already touched upon elements of this, but I wonder why is this, do you think? Is this purely because of lack of funding for the translation and distribution? Is there a lack of interest in the UK for old films, do you think? How can students like me help to attract interest in older films so they can have an official translation slash UK distribution. So uh, Jennifer, would you like to respond? Um, I mean, I'm really glad to hear that people are interested in older films. I guess one thing, and I don't know if this is gonna be a popular opinion, I don't want to set the chat on fire here just as we're about to come to the end of the discussion. Um, but full disclosure, my first book was actually about repetition in Japanese cinema. And one of the things that I think you do find in the 50s and 60s in particular, when there were really large numbers of films being produced every year in Japan, there's a very high degree of repetition. Um, so I can understand how perhaps for previous generations who were maybe seeing a little bit more of those films from that period, there might have been a sense of, you know, there was a lot of sameness. Um, whereas I think now we've maybe swung a little bit too far the other way and we don't see a lot of these films anymore. Um, I do think there's some real innovation and some, some fantastic work within that 50s, 60s, 70s kind of era, uh, but there is also quite a lot of um, churn, I guess. Uh, so that's possibly contributed to the idea of there being a kind of trashier or pulp pulpier end, I guess, to films from those decades that have not caught the attention of higher art programming uh, up until now, perhaps. Does anyone else on the panel um, have any questions? Yeah, Peter? Yeah, um, it's, it's kind of a chicken and egg thing in a weird way, because um, there are a lot of older Japanese films available in this country, but they've all got some kind of selling points that a distributor thinks, well, that I know I'm going to recoup based on A, the name of the director, so if it's someone with an established name, so uh, Kurosawa, obviously, or Shohei Imamura, or Nagisha Ostrima, or there's some kind of genre hook so they can sell it as a horror film that happens to be from Japan, a martial arts film that happens to be from Japan. And then, but then there's the, um, so like a lot of the stuff on at the Arrow player is kind of, it's a gangster film by the director of Battle Royale because they know that by saying, but from the director of Battle Royale, that a percentage of their customers' ears will prick up at that. But so there's all these films that, maybe the, the director hasn't got a huge long career that, or at least hasn't reached out internationally to become known where they've done work that's just as well but saying by director xxx that other than a few academics maybe and some especially keen japanese film fans in this country no one has any idea who that is so a distributor is going to say well i love this film but how am i going to sell it that's so but then without someone doing that, how does that person's name then become known so that then someone will say, well, I want to see other films by that director. So I don't know what the solution is, unfortunately. Thank you. Um, and I also think that, oh, sorry. Oh, I was, sorry, I'm no. sorry, Ren, I'm so sorry, carry on. No, 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 absolutely, no. I was just thinking that this is a problem that is actually, I think, connected also with like coverage in media of like older uh, Japanese films or maybe like, uh, even like newer films, but made by um, less known filmmaker, I would say, because if uh, obviously, I mean, there are some platforms that um, highlight um, uh, Japanese films in their totality. But if we look at like the biggest names, of course, like in, in covering films and like um, writing about criticism and this kind of stuff, I think that they're mostly like kind of a, a tied to uh, um, the the selling points of these films, and they're, they're, they're like kind of looking up: is there a market to like advertise these films? So, uh, for example, if I want to pitch something about like a lesser-known films, an editor is 
not usually like uh, that much interested if let's say the film is not getting a release in the UK and then in the end you're, you're quite it's kind of impossible to to highlight stuff that is not already going out so I think like th these two things are like connected so people can read about these films unless they just dig inside I don't know like academic stuff for example but not all people can just uh, I don't know just uh, pick up like a, an academic book and just read through it but they, maybe they would be like they would prefer to just browse sight and sound or something else but then again if the editor is not willing to just uh, take the risk in a way or at least uh, wanting like someone else to write about something that it's not going to get released then it's pretty hard to have people like uh, know about other stuff, yeah. And Ren, I wanted to ask you uh, another another question that's come in from Yi Wang, which is um, we're seeing a booming trend in uh, boys love yaoi uh, content in Japan recently, but some argue, argue that this might actually hinder a fair, authentic and diverse LGBTQ plus representation on screen. I think especially for queer female storytelling. I wonder, do you agree and what your thoughts are on this? I know this is one thing you touched on earlier, but if you could expand maybe. Yeah, well, I mean, in a way, like, uh, boys love any only thing were basically like starting being produced for like for a female audience. So, uh, of course, they're basically like uh, kind of representing an, an ideal type of like uh, men and like these kind of beautiful and idolized men that sometimes are not like reflecting like the reality of like people in, in, in Japan. And um, so um, that there are like different uh, kind of uh, types of um, of products about um, queer men in Japan. They're like um, they're, they're basically tailored to like men, and sometimes this this, this other work depict like muscular men, and then this is con something completely different. But I do agree that some of the uh, the boys love stuff um, could basically like present a kind of. Um, let's say a, a, a mixed representation of like female characters as well, because sometimes if the, this, this product, this, this work are produced for like a female audience, uh, this, this female audience, sometimes they're straight women, some other times they could be like bisexual women and lesser times they could be like lesbians. But then in the end, they're not really interested in like uh, seeing female characters in there. So uh, this could be limited to like people having like kind of an infatuation with one of the, uh, the boys, but then the boy obviously has like another relationship with a boy. And then, yeah, I, I, I keep seeing like uh, female characters not having that much uh, presence in this kind of, uh, of work. And of course there's a, a huge like amount of works about like um, girls love and beauty. But again, these are like tailored for a never, an even nicher kind of, of um, audience. So uh, it, it's hard for, for them to have like um, a platform, I would say. Thanks, Ryan. Um, the, uh, I'm gonna straight a couple of comments. Um, I, we're nearing the end now, so I'll get through as many as I can in the last um, moments of the uh, round table. So uh, Rajveer Kaur says, also I believe that more crime and mystery Japanese will be more on the interesting side as like Peter said, the Japanese culture is very strong for younger adults and teenagers who watch these. So a response to what Peter said earlier. Uh, JL Smith says the partnerships model Sounds very interesting. Um, this was going back to our discussion about um, partnering together to show the films across the UK. Would it be possible to crowdfund a specific film so that it could be brought over and streamed with people paying to see? Um, I have a question I'm going to direct uh, to Junko, which is a very simple one, is where will the uh, Japan Foundation have a summer program um, in person if allowed or online in 2021? Well, the answer is, mm. <laughs> Because we don't have a human resources, no budget. So unless the Japanese government agree to give us more money, it will be difficult, to be honest. Um, we just don't have a manpower. It's just like um, Daniel and I working tirelessly over six months. And uh, if the director comes, we are become a foot soldier and then going to run, you know, different places. I just didn't have any family life, you know, February, March. Uh, at all in the past few years, um, 10 years also. So um, we may do some uh, film screening sometime if that time allows, but it's, it's once a year is enough for us, to be honest. 
But I really want other people, you know, other than Japan Foundation, come forward, you know, with interesting ideas, interesting projects, because there is only so much we could do, Japan Foundation can do alone. So, I mean, this is my um, sort of wish in the future. I and mean, I just want one question. So, you know, Peter, I have a very interesting discovery. Okay. Um, in the past, the majority, demographically, um, um, it's a, every sort of age group is just evenly distributed um, according to our in the survey. But Derby uh, demography is slightly different. 25 and 34 you know, years old is you know, occupy 32 percent, really? which is lots more than that, 90 percent in total in general. Do you have any reason for it? Uh, I suppose it's because I guess when the Japan Foundation comes to Derby, maybe 50, 60 percent of audience of the audience are people who know Satori Screen, and have been. I kind of have built up a little cut kind of group of regulars now. It's not a massive group, but there are people who kind of trust me and they'll come to 10 out of every 12 films I put on or something like that. And the Japan Foundation has become their big event of the year because we do it in a single weekend. It's basically a mini Japanese film festival in three days where they can watch 10 or 12 films. And um, so, and I guess, I think it's to do with Quad's audience does tend to be a little bit older than teenagers. So the people we're reaching with our marketing is probably something I'm always working on is trying to find ways to reach 17 year olds with that varying success. And, but yeah, but unless it's anime, of course, whenever I put on an anime, the age of the audience drops in half, basically. So it's kind of, I, I'm, I, I, I'm not a huge anime fan, which, but I'm aware that people love anime. So I'm constantly aware that when I put on an anime, there's people in the audience who know more about it than I do. But yeah. uh, at the same time, if I put on an anime and a hundred people come to that, that means the month after I can show uh, yeah. Woman of the Dunes or something. Really big fans in the audience. I can see them from chat. That yeah. There's a lot of women, hello, and then sort of encouraging, you know, just mm -hmm. praising you for what you have done. Yeah. And then um, um, I, I can tell that how much you have, you know, worked, you know, hard to sort of promote Japanese cinema. So I'd like to thank you anyway. Yeah, thank for you, Jessica. that. But do you think that uh, in, in the course of that uh, years, uh, your Satori screen as well, Japan Foundation screen pro program, will help you, have, has helped you to increase audience numbers or just those people who appreciate, you know, um, Japanese cinema? Oh, well, yeah, um, I do. I kind of have my regulars at Story Screen who I know and talk to, but then I'll be at Quad and I'll be approached by someone I've never met in my life and they'll say, I really enjoyed XXX film and it's, it might be someone in their 40s or 50s uh, and who looks doesn't look like a regular story screen person. And I think the Japan Foundation does, we've now got to a point where people look forward to it. And even if they're not coming to everything, they're looking through and saying, okay, this year I'll watch that one or I'll watch these two or three. And it's kind of, it has become a fixture in Quad's kind of cinema year now that people expect and look forward to and hopefully for many years more. <laughs> That's, that's that's great you know to be yeah. honest with you every year every year i actually sort of you know run this program i always swear to myself this is going to be my last i want to go to do it again it's just too tiring too much um but uh, you know it seems like we have to carry on a bit longer and um, also also sorry jennifer do you think that um the number of that's a student for your course increase or decrease or just stay the same Oh, always increasing yeah. at the moment. <laughs> um, I think particularly uh, studying East Asia is, is feeling very relevant to people right now. So um, that's encouraging, yes. Hopefully we'll be building more and more generations with the kind of literacy, I suppose, that will help them to gravitate towards Japanese cinema and look out for maybe rarer or newer kinds of films. I should shut up my mouth, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> 
I think we have time for one last question. So I'm just selfishly going to say I agree with Gillian Chaplin. Can you show these Ipswich Film Theatre? Because that was the cinema that was my first cinema when I lived in Ipswich. Um, no, my last question is, what are you most looking forward to in the uh, touring programme this year? Um, I'll start with myself um, because uh, I will still recommend his because I think it's a really very moving and very warm film. But one thing that you might not get from it, from just seeing the trailers, it has one of the best performances by a child actor I have seen in a very, very long time. She is absolutely incredible. Um, and uh, yeah, I really, really recommend you check out his if you can. Uh, Jennifer, what are you looking forward to doing? I'm also looking forward to his, which I haven't seen yet, but I strongly recommend Mrs. Noisy. Um, it's a really interesting film and it takes on, I think, a lot of very contemporary issues, especially about representation on social media and things like this. So I go and see that one. And Ren? Yeah, I need to say his as well. It's like one of the um, top films I really want to catch up um, on. And also Hello World because like, I'm an anime fan, so I have to mention that one as well. And also I'm like, need to urge people to watch uh, Shape of Red, of course, because it's by a female filmmaker, uh, Mishima Yukiko. And it's also presents like a really great representation of like an empowered uh, female characters. And also, I think everyone should watch the, uh, the last film by uh, Obayashi Nobuhiko, which is finally screening and streaming in the UK. I had the, uh, the privilege to watch it like in a, in a real cinema setting in Rotterdam last year. And that was like an amazing experience. The film is like magnificent, although it's quite long. But I think like that people really have to watch that one. Thank you. I'll look that one up. And uh, Peter. Yes, my choice is also Labyrinth of Cinema. Mm -hmm. um, the director has kind of got this reputation based on one film in the West, House or Haosu, because people who have seen Haosu have not forgotten Haosu because it's a very insane sort of horror comedy from the late 70s. And we've been hearing, I've been reading stuff about this guy over the, maybe the last decade since Haosu kind of re-emerged, but actually getting to see some of his other work with English subtitles has been very, very difficult. I think Third Window Films put out one of his other films last year, but other than that, I think this is only the third of his films to be seen in this country. So I'm very excited to see that. And I am a sucker for films about film as well. So I'll probably be crying by the end of it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. And uh, as I pass the conch shell back to, to Junko, um, I'm sure you're not going to tell us what your favorite film is from the program, well, but I mean, let's see how you answer. I shouldn't, I shouldn't <laughs> say my favorite you know, uh, films, but of course there is some degree that I, you know, in my, in my uh, you know, uh, preference, of course. And uh, my first choice is The Shape of Red, to be honest, I like that film. I can watch it so many times. And uh, it's a little bit old fashioned in a way that, you know, the way of depicting Japanese women there. I mean, certainly that the protagonist is not me. I wouldn't behave like that, to be honest. But it certainly uh, renders very well that, um, you know, Japanese women confined in traditional way or whatsoever. That's really brilliant. And also, because I normally like, I'm really bookish, I like reading books. And then uh, The Shape of Red is based on you know, a very famous novel. And uh, it's just made so well. And his, of course, his is also the, my you know, favorite as well. Lovely Soul Cinema, yes, good. <laughs> if you endure 178 minutes, of course, it's a very long one. I watched twice. And uh, the only slight concern is that there's a lot of, lot of you know, loss in con uh, translation, probably because there is a lot of historical fact in uh, Robinson cinema. And uh, unless you know that a history of Japanese war, not just in that, uh, you know, the World War, but before that, you may be a little bit lost. You may be a little bit lost to what um, uh, it is happening. However, having said that, uh, it's a verb film. I don't really think anybody other than Obash can make it. So it's just worth watching. My last, Suggestion is Soare. Soare is a really good film. And it's minor probably, but I like that director who made a spark of life. And those people who joined the Japan Foundation uh, Touring Film Program before, you may remember that some um, old woman tried to sort of get married again. It's just 
you know, depicting that um, old, you know, uh, life which hasn't been, you know, uh, uncovered in Japanese cinema. But this time he touched upon that um, youth problem. So I, I'm, I just strongly recommend if you can watch it, you, you know, please watch. That's all. Final things I should say, right? <laughs> okay. Yeah. Anyway, thank you so much. I know many sort of behind the scenes, so it's a bit odd. So you know, I have to say that uh, in the remarks why I'm you know, um, staying on. Okay. Um, it, is, it has to be really interesting um, discussion, but I shouldn't have said it's an interesting discussion because I was on, but I generally thought that everybody actually threw the very interesting comments, which I wouldn't, even I wouldn't have heard otherwise. And then uh, Alex handled very well. Thank you, thank you so much. I mean, one thing I wanted to hear, but you didn't probably hesitate, is criticism of Japan Foundation Touring Film Program, I didn't mind that, to be honest, because uh, always you can actually pull out of that criticism. So um, those audiences who have, who, if you have any criticisms, we are happy to hear. So just send us email. <laughs> we don't guarantee we will answer that, uh, but we, you know, take it, you know, you take your comments very seriously and improve our program in the future. Anyway, thank you so much. I just want to say from six o'clock today, that first three films, Shade of, in Shade, in Shade of Red and the Miyamoto and the Me and My Brothers and Mistress will be streaming for tickets holders. So and some people may have already started watching it. And then just know that the director Haga for the Me and My Brother and Mistress and Mariko Tetsuya for Miyamoto will join Zoom talks as associated film events. So, if you don't have a ticket, don't worry about that. You can still join that to talk itself. So please check that um, our cinema website and join these talks too. Okay, now it's Diane showing that. That's fine. Thank you very much. Also, as I said before, we are obliged to send you that uh, audience survey um, every time you watch the film and then attend the talk. So just bear with us. And if you can, please uh, complete the questionnaire, send, that, send, it, send it back to us. So thank you so much for all of you once again. And then um, I hope that um, this um, tutoring pro program online will go success. No hiccup whatsoever. That's all I can actually tell now. Thank you so much. Thank you, bye.